Hey everybody, sorry I'm late. That's my fault, technical issues. Um, Gray Stallman, I'm the host of The Doctors In Live with TOA. I know we don't have our logo up because this is the topic we're gonna talk about today. Uh, but thanks for being here. Um, it's Friday, uh, should be a good weekend in Nashville, I think. Um, welcome back. For those people who've been here before, thanks for supporting this show. I hope it's helpful to you. I hope that uh, uh, it gives you some things to think about. Um, for those who've tuned in for the first time, welcome aboard. Um, my goal with these episodes is strictly for information and a little bit of education and maybe a little entertainment to help you all understand some of the things we deal with with musculoskeletal care. So that's everything from the, the head, top of your head down to the bottom of your feet bones, muscle, joints, nerves, that's what we do, okay? Um, TOA is the largest, oldest, most comprehensive orthopedic musculoskeletal practice in Middle Tennessee. Um, we actually reach from Knoxville to Columbia, uh, from uh, Southern Kentucky, almost all the way down to the uh, Tennessee-Alabama border. So um, we're, uh, we're pretty big. Um, if you have any needs, musculoskeletal wise, uh, go to toa.com. toa.com is our website. Uh, you can learn about our practices, about our locations, about our physicians, what services we have to offer. Uh, we have therapy in most of our locations. We have imaging such as MRI in several of our locations. Um, and uh, uh, in addition, you can go to the media center link um, which will give you a huge treasure trove of uh, past uh, informational videos we've done uh, with many of uh, the associates in TOA. All of my Facebook Live episodes are archived there. Um, uh, our recent uh, takeover, TOA takeover with Dr. Rose is there. Uh, you need to see him. He's crazy wild man and he's awesome. And uh, so those are great helpful tips. Um, that may give you some more information. As with all these episodes, please remember, while I'm an orthopedic surgeon, I'm a fellowship trained uh, spine surgeon. Uh, today, I'm not your surgeon, so don't take this information as gospel. It's not medical advice. It's merely information and maybe a little fun too. So without further ado, we're going to talk today about something a little bit more esoteric, uh, but it's actually a really important topic that uh, while it's not common, if it's going on with you, it's actually a really important problem. Uh, and that's what's called cervical spondylotic myelopathy. Cervical means the neck. Spondylotic means uh, compression related to uh, bone spurs, calcium deposits within the spine. And myelopathy means disease of the spinal cord. So essentially what this problem is, is a problem of slow, progressive spinal cord damage that can actually lead to be pe to lead people to be permanently impaired or even paralyzed if left to its own devices. It's not the same kind of being paralyzed as diving into a swimming pool and breaking your neck. This is a slow squeeze rather than a quick injury to the spinal cord, but it's subtle. It uh, comes on slowly, and um, a lot of people ignore it until it's gotten really bad. And so it's actually a really important topic to talk about because, frankly, the only treatment for cervical spondylotic myelopathy is surgery. Okay, so, uh, we, Therapy can't help it. Medications can't help it. Injections can't help it. Uh, the only thing we can do to try to help uh, with this disorder is to take the pressure off the spinal cord, okay? So we're gonna, I'm gonna be using some slides here. So uh, I'm gonna kind of sit here and I'll talk to you like this over my shoulder um, so we can talk about this further. So without further ado, I gotta get it right, there we go. Okay, so again, like I said, cervical spondylotic myelopathy, spondylotic myelopathy, CSM, um, is a progressive disease of spinal cord compression. Uh, and it has a real broad um, uh, complex of symptoms that people might feel. And they can be very subtle at first. 
simple things like numbness and tingling in the hands or the feet. Uh, one of the hallmarks is clumsiness in the hands. So uh, inability to do fine motor things. Buttoning buttons gets harder. Your handwriting gets a little more sloppy. You can't hold a pen or a fork or a spoon as well. You tend to drop things more easily. That can be an early um, uh, symptom. People can also have difficulties with balance and with walking. We start seeing people kind of shuffling their feet, dragging their feet more. They tend to walk with a little bit more wide-based gait because they don't have good balance. They don't have a good sensation, what's called proprioception, which is where your brain is trying to understand where the rest of your body is in space. Essentially, your brain doesn't know what your feet are doing. That can happen as the spinal cord compression increases. Later, we actually see more dramatic um, uh, things such as uh, progressive weakness in the arms or the legs, essentially becoming slowly paralyzed. It can affect one side, it can affect both sides. It can affect the arms worse than the legs. It can affect the legs worse than the arms. Some people have normal sensation, but they don't have uh, a normal feeling of vibration or temperature or this proprioception, the where is the earth uh, sensation. Um, and all of this depends on where the spinal cord is getting compressed. Um, uh, I noted up here reflex changes. That's one of the things we see on a physical exam where all of a sudden people's reflexes aren't right. They're either more hyperreflexic, they're greater reflexes. The reflexes are the things when the doctor bangs you in the knee with a hammer and your leg goes up. That's called a reflex and there's reflexes in your arms and reflexes in your legs and sometimes changes in the reflexes can actually be a hint that there's a bigger problem with your neurological system, your brain, your spinal cord, and the nerves. And so um, you can imagine that progressive dysfunction, progressive decrease in function could be a real problem. And the trouble with CSM is it does not get better. It's a constant progression of worsening. Now we may see times when people have symptoms that worsen for a while and then plateau, they kind of stay the same. But then they worsen more and they kind of stay the same. People call this a stepwise progression. Um, the trouble is, is because nerves, and we're gonna talk about the spinal cord in a second, nerves, and the spinal cord, which is a big bundle of nerve cells, don't like pressure on them, they can permanently change, and over time, they will not rebuild themselves. And so you start seeing decline in nerve cell function, and nerves. you can actually see nerve cell death with this type of problem, and that leads to chronic, progressive, and permanent changes. And so our goal with treatment of people with CSM is number one, diagnose it early so we can get people with as high level of function as possible and treat it aggressively in most cases. Now there are some people we will watch, but the majority of people by the time they get to us, they're bad enough that we need to do something about it. But treat them aggressively with the goal of first, stopping it from getting worse. The basic thing that I tell patients is our goal is to make sure that to hope with everything we can with what we do to keep it from getting worse with the hope that some of your nerve cells will be able to recuperate, regenerate, and you can get some function back. Most people, even if we get at them early, most people will still have some long-term forever uh, problems. Our hope is that we can get it where it's still somewhat reversible so we can get back as much as we can um, given the fact that the spinal cord and the nervous system is a very sensitive structure. So again, the important thing for us and for patients is to get it diagnosed early where you still have most of your function. And you can see as things progress very subtly, it can be hard to know, you know, it's very human nature to say, oh, you know, my hands are numb and tingly, or I'm kind of clumsy a little bit. Oh, we'll just watch it. And six months go by or a year go by, and now you can't button your buttons anymore. And that can become permanent. So 
when these subtle changes occur, um, it's hard to sometimes recognize them and then act on them. Additionally, there are some other disorders that can lead to problems similar to this. So neurologic diseases like multiple sclerosis, um, uh, uh, peripheral neuropathy, um, uh, Parkinsonism, these types of things can lead to um, symptoms that are very similar and it's sometimes challenging to finally understand what's causing what. Um, you know, we get older, we get weaker, we get less mobile as we get older, um, and, uh, and that can be a confusing factor as well. So it really is, uh, for us, for the spine surgeons, for orthopedic surgeons, it's really a matter of looking at everybody with similar types of symptoms with a high degree of suspicion, and then look for it, okay? So we're gonna talk a little bit about the spinal cord. The spinal cord is in your spine. Remember from our previous anatomy lessons that the spinal column is made up of bones and discs, and that stack of bones and discs creates a tube or channel where the spinal cord and the nerves run. So it's a pipe that runs up and down your body. Nerves come out at each level where there's a disc, and the, the nerves come up the spine and attach to the skull, and the spinal cord is that accumulation of nerves from the lower, from the extremities, from the legs, and then the chest, and then the arms, all coming together into a big rope, a cord, that's made up of all these individual nerve cells and fibers that go up and become part of your brain. And so the spinal cord has wires that run downstream from your brain down to the end organs, like your hands and your feet, and there are nerves that run upstream from your hands and feet up to the brain. The downstream nerves are really designed for function, so it's things, instructions sent to your muscles. So you know, it t your brain tells your hand to close. That's a, a descending pathway of muscle function to the muscles that help us close our hand. I stub my toe and it hurts. When I bang my toe, the ascending or um, going up fibers tell the go up and tell the brain that you hurt your toe. And so it's this huge network of cells uh, throughout the spinal cord that give us um, all these abilities to sense, feel, and do. Now you can see here, this is the spinal cord. It's a, it's a, it's, this is not a picture, this is a, a representation. It's a, it's a cartoon, if you will. Um, but what you can see is in this uh, picture, the red is going down from the brain. This is the front, this is the back. We're looking down the spinal cord. The blue is coming up from the end organs. But like here, the red here, there would be a patch of the red cells here. Here is blue, there'd be blue here as well, okay? So it's really a solid deal. And so varying places where there's different nerve cells, they do different things. So the motor is muscle function, the pain and temperature out to the side, the lateral spinal thalamic tract are sensations. There's different nerves that uh, uh, traverse sensation of light touch into the front, the ventral, front, spinal thalamic tract, and then fine touch, proprioception, vibration, that's actually in the back of the spinal cord, okay? And so all of those fibers are coming up and down. So you can see that if you have pressure on the spinal cord in one area, you may get changes in pain, temperature, and some motor function in certain areas, but some things may be spared. And so it can look like a lot of different things depending on where the compression of the spinal cord is. The most common areas we see the spinal cord getting compressed is in the dorsal column, the back, which is the mu muscle function and these fine, mu fine touch and proprioception. Proprioception, again, is where your brain tries to figure out where your feet are. And then out to the sides or uh, out to the front. So we'll get compression from the front which can cause compression in the back. So many people will have changes in light touch and strength and motor, fine touch, proprioception, vibration, but have retained sensations of pain and temperature, for example. Many times myelopathy is not painful. In fact, most of the time it's not painful. It's usually other sensations like 
um, light touch, like uh, vibration, these types of things. Um, so you can see that while this depiction is rather simple, it's actually a really complicated neural anatomy. Okay, And again, compression can come onto the spinal cord for several different reasons. So what are the causes? So basically it's compression of the spinal cord. And the two main causes are spondylosis or arthritis, the degenerative changes of the joints and the discs that surround the spinal cord. Uh, what's called ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Inside that tube that's made up of the bones and discs, there's a big ligament strap that connects all of those together in the front of the tube, and then there's one in the back of the tube. And so ossification, which means calcium buildup becoming bone of the ligament in the front, which is the posterior longitudinal ligament, that's in the front of the uh, spinal canal, the back of the vertebral body, that ligament. If that gets thicker, space gets cr crowded and the spinal cord gets compressed. And then lastly is sometimes people can develop myelopathy due to progressive deterioration of the spinal cord, scarring of the spinal cord related to some, oftentimes some form of trauma of the spinal cord, whether that's a broken bone, a dislocation, or just stretching of the spinal cord. People can have progressive scar formation or death of the cells of the spinal cord and can cause progressive symptoms. Um, so this is spondylosis. This is the degenerative problem. And basically we're looking at your spine from the side. This little pictogram here, the bones are these brown looking structures in the front. The discs are the gray stripes that go in between the bones. The yellow area is the spinal canal or the spinal cord inside the spinal canal, and the joints are in the back. So you can have degeneration of the discs and causing protrusion of the disc squeezing on the spinal cord. You can have bone spurs that develop, calcium buildup around the disc that compresses the spinal cord. You can have arthritis changes of the joints causing calcium deposits to build up, uh, cysts to form, that type of thing that causes compression from the back. So it's oftentimes kind of this pincher compression of the, um, of the uh, spinal cord, and that's related to the breakdown, the age-related changes, the wearing out of the moving parts, which are the discs and the joints. I always tell patients, the spinal cord and the nerves don't have a whole lot of extra room around them. So if you start building up bone uh, si joint size because they're arthritic, calcium builds up on the bones and they get bigger. If the discs start collapsing down in height and start getting broader or bulging out, the, the, they're consuming space somewhere. And the problem is around the nerves in the spinal cord, it's usually the nerves in the spinal cord that are taking the pressure. Um, so that's why we have so many problems with degenerative changes in the spine causing nerve symptoms. So spondylosis, this is a typical MRI looking at the side. This is actually one of my patients looking uh, at the spine from the side. And so here's the chin, this direction. The base of your skull is here. The shoulders are down here. Again, the stripe is the spinal cord. The white is the spinal fluid that basically the spinal cord floats in. And you can see here and here, it looks like things are pinching in. The disc here is bulging out. The disc here is bulging out. The joints back here are protruding backward. And you can see it almost looks like a washboard. For those of you old enough to, to know what a washboard is, it's a surface that looks like this. Um, for those young enough, that's what that is. Um, those people who've never seen a washboard. Go to the fairgrounds and go to the flea market and you'll see a washboard. Um, that can lead to compression or squeeze on the spinal cord. And you can actually see, see how the spinal cord's kind of dark gray here? You can see here it looks kind of light gray. That light gray is actually signs of damage to the spinal cord nerves. And so because of the long-standing pressure on the spinal cord, this patient's spinal cord is not functioning like it's supposed to. And this fella, he's middle-aged, probably 60, um, had quite a lot of trouble with clumsiness in his hands, numbness and tingling in his hands, weakness in his, weakness in his hands and arms, and he stood and walked with a really wide-based gait because his, 
He was afraid of catching a toe or falling down or, or tripping because his feet didn't know where his, or his brain didn't know where his feet were. That loss of proprioception. This is a different view of the same patient. You can see this scallop look of the discs and the, nerve, and the, uh, the spinal cord getting squeezed. Um, sorry. OPLL, remember, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. These cartoons are representatives of various types of OPLL. That we're, again, we're looking at the spine from the side. These are the bones, the blocks, the discs or the spaces in between. There's a ligament in the front called the anterior longitudinal ligament. And then the posterior longitudinal ligament is in the back and the joints are back here. So the spinal cord runs in this area. There should be a tube running up and down here. And this little graph just shows, you know, you can have kind of a confluence of the calcium deposits of that ligament. Basically that rubbery strap now becomes solid bone. And you can see if it becomes solid, the space where the spinal cord is, which would be here, gets compressed. It can be segmental like this. It can be kind of some of both. And then it can be, this is more the uh, calcium deposits around the disc space that basically the, as the disc wears out, uh, bone starts building up around the edges of the disc and can cause compression. And you can imagine if there was a structure right in this area here in each of these pictures, it could get squeezed on. Interestingly, OPLL um, is far more common in Japanese people than it is in uh, North Americans. Um, we're not sure why, it's obviously a genetic thing. Um, but much of the data that's come out and the techniques to try to help manage myelopathy related to OPLL comes out of Japan. So this is a, a, an MRI of an OPLL patient. And you can see, again, we're looking at you from the side, the bones are the gray blocks, the discs are the spaces in between, and the, the calcium buildup of that ligament it's kind of this dark black line right along here, and you can see all the way along this kind of smooth squeeze of the spinal cord. If we look at you end on, this is the same patient, so that this picture is cutting you like a loaf of bread um, horizontally. So we're slicing up your spine, laying on your back. So here's the back, here's the front. Basically, the way the MRI looks is your feet are out here, and we're looking towards your head. So we're looking up the spinal canal, which is right here, that's the spinal cord. This is that bone that's developed. Normally the spinal cord should fill up this whole space and you can see how much squeeze there is. Well, if there's squeeze at multiple levels, you can start seeing dysfunction at multiple levels in the, in the body. Um, so what are the treatments for cervical spondylotic myelopathy? If you were listening, almost always it's surgery. And the reason being is this is a slow process of squeeze. This is not something that um, is an inflammation or an irritation of the nerves. It is compression of the nerves. And so most of the time, nearly all the time, there's very rare circumstances where we'll watch things for a while. But most of the time when people show up in my office, their symptoms have gotten pretty substantial. They can't use their hands. They can't walk well. They're weak. They're clumsy. They have difficulty standing. You know, the horse is kind of out of the barn at that point. And so, again, our goal with, with treatment is, number one, hopefully keeping it from getting worse by taking the pressure off the spinal cord. Number two, praying, hoping that your body has some reserve to improve things to some degree. Some people get a lot of improvement. Many people get some improvement. Occasionally, people don't get any improvement at all. And then to keep it from getting worse is make sure that we have um, pressure off the spinal cord at all the levels that are being affected. And so as you've seen with our pictures, sometimes the pressure is from the front, the discs and the bones and that ligament. Sometimes it's from the back, the um, ligaments in the back and the joints. Sometimes it's squeeze on both. And so our approach with surgery really kind of depends on where the squeeze is. And so we can go anteriorly, which means from the front. So we a, a, approach the neck from the front um, to take the discs out, take the bone out if we need to, take the pressure off the nerves, and then stabilize that there. So that's anterior decompression. Decompression means remove pressure. 
infusion, we have to stabilize. When we take things out, we have to stabilize things together in order for um, uh, us not to get into further future problems. And so the only way we have to try to stabilize the spine in this particular case is fusion of allowing, we've talked fusion before, allowing bone to grow in that area to make it more rigid and stable. Posterior decompression and fusion is posterior is from the back of the neck. Um, that's often called laminectomy. And we will do laminectomy, which is removal of the back wall of the, of the spinal canal. So if, if, the, if the patient is laying on their belly like this, and this is the spinal canal right here, we basically open up by removing bone the back of the spine to allow the spinal cord to kind of float free. And typically we fuse the spine together so it can't shift or move. And then there's a, a procedure that was really developed in Japan called laminoplasty. Because it, as you can imagine, um, fusion of the spine doesn't, is, is a useful tool, but it doesn't create a normal spine. It's, making, it's removing motion. It's, it's making things more rigid. And so laminoplasty, which is essentially a technique, and I've got a slide for this, a technique where you take the lamina in the back of the neck and cut it partway and hinge it up so that it's still connected, it's not completely removed, but the space for the spinal cord is increased. That theoretically allows retention of some mobility and motion in the spine without having to resort to fusion. That technique was really developed in, in Japan when a lot of people needed these types of procedures, yet we were trying to minimize the um, effects of fusing multiple levels. Because the biggest effect, there's two things that can affect uh, people if they've had a fusion. Number one is you've reduced motion, so people get stiffer. The other is if you reduce motion and and take away motion that was designed to be shared by all those levels you fuse, the levels that are left behind, the adjacent segment levels, the next door neighbors, can wear out more quickly. And so you can get into problems of what we call fusion disease, where we've done the right thing for the current problem, but we get into problems in the future because we've changed the mechanics of the spine. And laminoplasty is one way to try to help reduce that chance. So this is an anterior approach. This is actually the spondylosis guy that I showed you. He's a patient of mine. And so remember, he had problems at, so here's number two, here's number three. He had problems at three, four, four, five, five, six, and six, seven. He had problems at all levels. And so what we did was we removed the bone in the front. We removed the disc in the front. And this kind of shadow right here is actually a big block of bone that we put in there. It's actually a fibula bone taken from a, a cadaver. And then we put this metal plate and screws on there. And eventually what happens is all those bones together grow solid and become solid. And so we took the pressure off the nerves and after destabilizing his spine, we restabilized his spine by putting this uh, graft and the metal plate and screws. This is looking at it from the side, that's looking at it from the front. And that guy was amazing. He was um, really impaired and Thankfully, he saw profound improvement in his function. Um, he was almost back to normal. He's this big, thick country guy that does a lot of stuff on a farm, does a lot of you know building stuff and whatnot. And he was able to get back to doing all that kind of stuff um, with almost normal function. He wasn't completely normal, but he was profoundly better than what he was. He couldn't feed himself practically because he couldn't hold a spoon um, before surgery and after surgery, uh, once he was healed, and that takes about 12 to 18 months to get spinal cord recovery to happen, he was remarkably uh, better. I've actually seen him and followed him for his lower back, which is a bigger problem than his neck, and I also take care of his wife. So this is uh, this fella with the MRI, and we can see here's that bone graft strut that we put in. Here's the space where the compression was. Remember the washboard effect? You don't see the washboard anymore. But I did bring this up because in this part picture particularly, you can see that here's the diameter or the, or the width of the spinal cord, and you can see right here, it's still narrow, okay? It still looks different than these. So that tells us that that's permanent scarring of the spinal cord. Now, fortunately, the scarring didn't involve some of the structures that uh, uh, 
he still has good function. So um, it, the spinal cord definitely doesn't look normal in that picture. Okay, so anterior and posterior, again, we go through the front, we remove the bone and the calcium deposit. This is an OPLL patient. Um, we remove all the washboard and stuff here. We take that block out. We have this metal cage device that's filled with bone, metal plate and screws to allow this to fuse together. This patient also had so much compression because sometimes it's difficult to get all this out that they went back in. Now this was not my patient. This is just an internet search picture. They went back in and removed bone in the back to make the diameter of the spinal canal wide open and then added this extra set of screws in the back to allow further stabilization. So that's an anterior posterior approach to kind of get at it from 360 degrees. Now this is the laminoplasty. So these pictures, these drawings are looking at you end on. So remember the MRI that cuts you like a loaf of bread horizontally and you're looking at yourself from your feet toward the head. I think this is actually reversed. Um, so we're looking at you from the head toward the feet, but it doesn't really matter. So this is the lamina, and this is normally connected right here. So this kind of hoop right here, you can see it's the back wall of the spinal canal. There's the cord. Laminectomy is where we remove that. So we cut it here, cut it here, and take that away. So it unroofs the spinal cord. Uh, but in many of those patients, we actually have to add fusion in order to make it more rigid. What laminoplasty does, and this isn't exactly, there's many variations on this, you cut one side, you hinge the other side, and you crack this open like this, and then put some sort of spacer in this area here to allow this to stay open. So what you've done is you've decompressed the spinal cord, but you haven't destabilized the spine. Laminoplasty is a very technically challenging procedure. Um, a lot of people can't do it because they never trained doing it. I've not done many of them, frankly, because it kind of came on after I started training. But in certain patients, it can be a very useful tool in trying to help alleviate the spinal cord compression while maintaining some of the motion. Nobody would tell anybody that they will have normal motion in their neck because the spine anatomy has been changed, but the theory behind it is maintain motion to some degree so that we can decrease the chance of that fusion disease of the adjacent segment breakdown. So that's the, the end of my pictures. Um, so spondylotic myelopathy, while not common, is more common than people are willing to admit. It is a devastatingly bad problem for those people who finally come to see us way down the line. So the key to spondylotic myelopathy, cervical spondylotic myelopathy, CSM, is first early diagnosis. So when patients start having symptoms, numbness, tingling, clumsiness, wide-based, uh, fumbly gait, weakness in their arms or their legs, um, those are kind of the main ones. Um, it's far better for their doctors um, to have somebody seen earlier, to have that patient be seen earlier rather than later. It's far better for the patient or their family members who are observing this thing to have somebody seen earlier rather than later. Now again, it could be some other neurological type of disease, but this is one of the, the problems that we can actually treat and actually get a reasonable outcome if we get it early enough. Some of the diseases, uh, the degenerative neurological diseases, we can slow the process, but we can't cure the problem. And that's more on the medical neurological side. So early diagnosis is absolutely uh, vital in trying to help ma maintain as much function as we can get. Number two, the treatment for myelopathy is almost always surgery. Again, there are some cases where we'll watch for a while, um, particularly if symptoms are very minimal or mild, but most spine surgeons uh, are, are, are fairly quick to move forward with surgery with any degree of significant neurologic deficit. Because again, our hope is to arrest the problem from getting worse, that's our number one priority, with the hope 
that we can see some return of function and improvement in function, okay? So we gotta kinda catch the, the horse as it's leaving the barn and grab onto the reins and pull it back in rather than try to find the horse in the pasture somewhere. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and then lastly, it's um, aggressively decompressing the spinal cord wherever there's compression. So whether it's from the front, whether it's from the back, whether it's from both, whether it's from laminoplasty, uh, the goal is get the pressure off the spinal cord. The last thing I wanna mention, and I kinda of touched on it with our very first patient, is it took that fella about 12, maybe 18 months to get to his new normal, to get as good as he can get. And the reason why that is, it's not the fusion that took that long, it's the spinal cord recovery. Spinal ner or nerves, and particularly the spinal cord, does have some degree of ability to recover, but it's a slow process. And it can take 12 to 18 months for the nerves to get as good as they're gonna get. That is not the same thing as nerves or spinal cord getting to be normal. I, I have to emphasize that. We are not trying, we are hoping for normal we are likely not gonna get completely normal, but as good as your body can get is really that time frame. So that's the realistic goal of this process. It's frankly the realistic goal of any of our spine surgery, nerve-related treatments is we hope to get as much improvement as possible, but we can't force the body to be normal. Um, taking the pressure off early is a big component of hoping to get as much function return as possible. So I think that's it. That's cervical spondylotic myelopathy. It's actually an extremely interesting uh, disorder. Um, it, once you've seen it, you never forget it. Um, I learned about it when I was a spine fellow, and it was fascinating to me to see all the varying ways that people show up in the office with symptoms. They're lots different than not, nobody's ever the same as another person, and the varying ways that we have to try to address it depending on where the problems are and where the compression is. So I hope this is somewhat interesting to you. Um, uh, please, if you have questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. You can just uh, enter a comment down below and we'll try to get you a, uh, an answer to that. There's some things I just don't know the answer to because uh, uh, I don't know everything, uh, um, but uh, it's an interesting topic. So this, we've talked about in the past, spinal stenosis, which is mostly in the lower spine. This is really spinal stenosis of the neck. And there's a much bigger problem with this because the spinal cord has no extra room and there's a lot more riding on uh, getting rid of the compression on spinal cord than there is on the individual nerves that are down the lower back. So it's a really different, interesting, challenging problem. So I think that's it. Um, Casey, do we have anything scheduled for next week? You. Me. I'll be back. I'm going to find out another topic. Maybe you have a suggestion for a topic. Please, I, I, I'd be happy to talk about anything. While I'm a spine surgeon uh, and spine is kind of my area of expertise, if there's things of the general musculoskeletal world, it doesn't have to be a specific de disease. It can be... Um, uh, exercise, it can be whatever you'd like to talk about that might be interesting to you, uh, put it down in the comments and I'll try to figure out a topic. Otherwise, by the end of the weekend, I'll have a topic for you and um, we'll get that going. So uh, uh, remember, go to toa.com, uh, learn about TOA, learn about Tennessee Orthopedic Alliance, uh, find information about your problems, don't let things wait, come in, see one of our experts, uh, foot, ankle, hand, uh, knees, shoulders, back, neck, um, whatever you've got going on, uh, we have a way of helping you to address your problems, help you to live a better life, and get back into function. So please don't, don't wait on things, delay on things. We're here to help you. Uh, and uh, with that, I think I'll sign off. Thanks again. Um, thanks for the support. I appreciate you um, being interested in this. Uh, please I want to address the, your concerns and interests, so if you have a comment, uh, a question, uh, I'm happy to try to answer that for you. We'll see you next Friday, noon Central Time, 
for another edition of the Doctors in Live with TOA here on Facebook. Um, if you want to see our prior episodes, go to the Media Center at TOA.com. Again, thanks a lot. I appreciate your support. Uh, we'll see you next time. Have a great weekend.